After World War I, the U.S. Navy's brief alliance with the British Royal Navy gave way to disagreements over disarmament, fleet size, interpretations of freedom of the seas, and general economic competition. This go-it-alone approach lasted until the next World War, when the U.S. Navy found itself fighting alongside the British, Canadian, Australian, and other Allied navies until the surrender of Germany and Japan. In this episode of the NASO Video Podcast, we're joined by author Corbin Williamson as he discusses his book, The U.S. Navy and Its Cold War Alliances, 1945 to 1953. Corbin will explore the transformation this cooperation brought about in the U.S. Navy's engagement with other naval forces during the Cold War. North American Society for Oceanic History was created by maritime scholars who met in 1971 at the University of Maine. They recognized that in North America there was no forum for maritime history or a society devoted to the study and promotion of maritime history. The aim of the original group of organizers was to create a diverse organization based initially on Canadian and American membership, which would gain the interest of others. Now there are members worldwide. And it is this diversity of membership that continues to make NASO a truly unique organization. 2020 marked the first year in recent memory that NASA was unable to meet, and therefore we bring historians, archaeologists, and students who are scheduled to present. Welcome to the North American Society for Oceanic History video and podcast. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. The goal of the NASO podcast is to bring you some of the best historians, professionals, and up-and-comers in the field of maritime history. Today we're heading to Alabama and being joined by Dr. Corbin Williamson. He's the author of the new book, The United States Navy and Its Cold War Alliances, 1945 to 1953. Dr. Williamson is an assistant professor of strategy at the Air War College in Montgomery, Alabama. He holds a PhD from the Ohio State University and a BA from Texas A&M. Welcome, Corbin, to the NASO Video Podcast. I'm glad to be here. This is a, a, a great forum, and I've really enjoyed some of the previous podcasts that have come out of this, uh, out of this series. I should say up front as a federal employee that the views that I'm expressing today are my own and do not necessarily represent those of Air University, the Department of the Air Force, or the U.S. government. So. And my views are not of the U.S. government, but they most assuredly should be. But again, <laughs> I don't work for the government, so I can, I can always get away with saying that. Uh, Corbin, it's great to have you back on. We were on a little bit of a hiatus here over the summertime. Uh, I had a, a work issue where I had to get the, the university up and running, and so we kind of held off for a while, but we're starting back up, and I can't think of a better one to start with than you. Uh, we're going to be talking about your new book, which is out, and I appreciate the copy sent to me, and we're going to have this uh, in the show notes so everybody can link over to it. And one of the things I, I wanted to kind of kick off with here and discuss is, is number one, the, the reason for the topic. I'm always interested in why historians choose a topic that they do. And, and, and this is a very unique topic because right from the beginning, I, I loved your introduction. I love the fact that you're attacking a paradigm right off the bat, this, this concept that the U.S. Navy was, was, was basically on its own post-Cold War, and it was really only focusing on itself. And so right from the very beginning, you kind of challenged that, that assumption. So what got you interested in this topic, and, and how did you go about approaching uh, the research for it? So I, uh, I did my master's thesis on the repairs that are done on British warships in American shipyards in 1941 under lease, lend lease before Pearl Harbor. And that got me interested in cooperation between the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy uh, during the Second World War. As I was looking around, I noticed that there wasn't as much on the post-war period. And I thought it was interesting how uh, the, the, although the U.S. Navy had cooperated closely with the British in World War I, neither side, for a, a number of reasons, makes serious efforts to sustain that relationship in terms of their interoperability in the 1920s and the 1930s. That's in stark contrast to what happens after World War II. And I thought, this is kind of an interesting question. Why is it different? Why did that happen then? And in terms of the, the research, so I was able to draw upon materials uh, from archives from all the four countries I look at, the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, and Australia. Uh, and so a mix of personal papers and official papers, kind of in all of those places. Uh, and hopefully kind of all together, I'm gonna, able to tell the story of these four navies and how they related together. Having said that, I, if I ever had to 
uh, do another book. I'm not doing one that involves four different navies. That's that's a lot to keep track of and organize and structure. Well, at least you chose, at least there were navies that all spoke English, which is, I think, one of the big issues <laughs> that's at play here. I, I want to go back for a second and, and talk. Number one, I, I, I always loved your topic you did for, for your dissertation. I think that's such a great one, looking at the, uh, the, uh, the issue with British repairs in American yards. And it really comes through in your, uh, your uh, chapter on standardization, just everything down from screws to 15-inch guns for the war spite just really, I mean, just leaps out at you from that. But, you know, you, you paint a very interesting picture, and I, I always thought I, I liked the, the way you introduced this by talking about the, um, uh, uh, the arrival of the American battleships at Scapa Flow in uh, December of 1917, December 7th, 1917. It was an ironic day for them to arrive there. And, and how they operated, how they seamlessly really came in and became the sixth battle, uh, sixth battle squadron of, of, of the Royal Navy, of the, of, of the Grand Fleet, and really for the rest of the war operated literally as a, a key component of that. And then you, you kind of juxtapose that with the deployment of Task Force 57, which is the, the British Pacific Fleet, uh, the arrival of the Duke of York uh, there at the surrender ceremony right next alongside the Missouri at the, at the end of the battle, uh, at the end of the war, when the surrender c- ceremony takes place. And, and I, I want to talk about that a little bit about that World War II experience, because I think that World War I, World War II experience is a topic I like a lot and I'm really interested in. I was wondering if you could talk about how well the U.S. Navy and the British Navy operated together in both World War I and World War II, and why that's so key for, for the thesis you're putting forward here on the post-World War II alliance system. So I think the thing that, the, that both the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy experience in the First and the Second World War is that it took time to build up their ability to operate together. So the Sixth Battle Squadron arrives, you know, as we see in the painting uh, in December 1917, Admiral Beatty, the fleet commander, writes uh, in one of his letters in 1918 that it took several months for the Americans to become proficient in using British signals and British formations and to get up to the Grand Fleet's gunnery standards. And so there's a, there's a process, there's a, an assimilation period that's required and that's aided by the, the personal relationships that officers and crew form between ships that occurs uh, as well in the Second World War, the challenge they have in the Second World War is that there are not as many instances where, the, where a single group of American warships operates with a British squadron for almost a year and a half, right? Where that, that, that does happen uh, in, the, in the First World War, I guess, well, for a year for, uh, for the Grand Fleet. Um, it's, the, the cooperation tends to be on a shorter scale. So we send ships to reinforce the British home fleet in 1942 and again in 1943. And the British send Task Force 57 that operates with the Pacific fleet for a couple months at the, in the summer, in the late spring and the summer of 1945. Um, in all of those instances, there's, a, there's that assimilation period that they have to go through to become used to working together and using somebody else's tactical books and signals and procedures, getting used to their logistical train, how they organize themselves. The British in particular, uh, when they are putting together the British Pacific Fleet, uh, which as David Hobbs has pointed out, is one of the largest fleets the Royal Navy has ever put to sea, uh, spend a lot of time thinking about how are we going to conduct long-range carrier strike warfare that the Americans have been doing for several years in the Pacific, and we haven't given as much attention to that. Not that we can't learn it, uh, but we've been focused on, uh, you know, we've been doing a bunch of amphibious assaults uh, around the perimeter of Europe and and supporting the army and defeating the German, the German submarine threat. So there's a reorientation that's required uh, when they go to the Pacific in the summer of 1945. I'm wondering what you think about, because as, reading, as I was reading the book and I started thinking about how the U.S. Navy operates with the Royal Navy in World War II, and, and one of the things that comes to my mind is, is the U.S. Navy is not just one entity in, in World War II. It's so large, so complex, and they have different you know, experiences. So if, you know, if you were the U.S. Navy in the Atlantic, you have a much more uh, of an operational, you know, savvy with the British because of convoy operations, because of, as you mentioned, the deployment of Task Force 99 to scap a flow, even in the Mediterranean to a certain extent, you have a greater influence. If you're in the South Pacific, especially if you're with uh, the Seventh Fleet later on, you're operating with the Australians much more. 
But if you're with the Central Pacific Fleet, if you're with the Third and Fifth Fleet during the drive across the Pacific, you'll almost never operate with the British. And, I, and I'm wondering how much you think that influence comes in, because like you said, there, there's an interesting play there with, with some officers seem very easy to kind of operate with the British, Australians, uh, and Canadians, where others have a little bit more hesitancy. I'm wondering if you think there's a little bit of that coming into play as, as we emerge out of the post-World War II environment. Yes, certainly the, the level of experience that you as an American naval officer have operating with foreign navies, as you pointed out, varies considerably based on where you spent most of your war. Having said that, uh, many officers go back and forth and they'll have an Atlantic job and a Pacific job and maybe a staff job. Um, so that many do get experience, you know, uh, operating with foreign navies in different theaters. The, although, you know, as you pointed out, for the Third Fleet and the Fifth Fleet, uh, when Task Force 57 shows up, they are, um, that's, a, a, that's a, a newer experience for them because they hadn't operated with British formations uh, for an extended period of time. Whereas for the Seventh Fleet, uh, there'd been an Australian Admiral, uh, um, or a Royal Navy Admiral on succumb to the Australian Navy and then uh, Admiral Collins, or uh, Commodore Collins as the head of the cruiser destroyer group in the seventh fleet. So they'd actually been commanding that force. So if you're in that group, right, obviously you can have far more experience. So I do think that is part of the, the, um, the experience that the US Navy has in the second world war that then shapes the way it operates in the post-war era. And you make a great example of using the ABDA, the American, British, Dutch, Australian fleets experience early in the war, which, which to me is, is one of the most interesting to, to watch that period. Uh, and, you know, what do, what do they, they come out, what do the Americans, the British, Australians come out of that experience with that's really going to influence them as they head into the post-World War II environment? So the almost universal conclusion from reports of those involved in the the Abda force that is eventually defeated in the Battle of the Java Sea, and then later in the Battle of Sunda Strait, is that the ships from these four navies were put together at the last minute uh, with no time to exercise together, limited communication abilities, and no shared tactical doctrine. And all of those things hurt their performance in the Battle of the Java Sea. And so there's a there's a recognition that flows out of that, and you can see this in the Office of Naval Intelligence narrative that's prepared uh, in the summer of 1942, assessing the battle. There's an, a realization that these multinational naval operations can't be thrown together at the last minute. It requires time and preparation and staff work in advance to weld these units together. We can't just throw them together in the way that we did in in the as we had to in the Battle of the Java Sea, so that's there's definitely a, a sense of uh, the time required uh, that comes out of this experience. And you kind of set this up then, so you start talking about the post-war period. So you come out of World War II, and, and the British and American navies are by far the supreme forces on the high seas. There's nothing that comes close to them in in, in any way whatsoever. And, you know, I've been reading uh, the two brand new books came out on the maritime history of World War II. That's been great. Craig Simon's book came out. Uh, uh, Mosley's book came out, too, on that. It's been really interesting seeing the global perspective of the war at sea. And now all of a sudden, you know, here you are. You're hitting that period right from 1945 to 53. And one of the things that obviously has to begin to happen, this is prior to the forming of NATO. This is really, you know, you're catching that key period here where those navies are coming off that war experience they face potential issues. There's the emerging, uh, emerging threat of the Soviet uh, submarine threat, a third battle of the Atlantic. Uh, and the Navy has, the U.S. Navy particularly, has to figure out how it wants to work with these other navies. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit, because obviously it's very easy that we could have gone the same way we did after World War I. The Americans and British go their own way. They don't really operate. Even the Dominion navies kind of stay aligned. So what is it that brings them together, and how successful are they at doing that? So I think the Soviet threat plays a, a really central role in pulling these navies together. There's growing concern, even in 1945, about what a relation is going to look like with the Russians after the war. And as the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy conduct, conduct tests with captured German Type 21 submarines, uh, and they know that the Russians have gotten their hands on these submarines as well, and on engineers and scientists and the uh, schematics 
they're concerned about, as you said, a third battle of the Atlantic. And so the, the shared concern over Russian naval, in particular submarine capabilities, plays a really important role in drawing, pulling them together. The first exchange agreements that they make uh, related to exchanging information, sharing technical data, and allowing contact between staff, staff offices are all focused on the field of anti-submarine warfare. And then they grow after that. But so you can see how they begin in the field of ASW and then spread to other areas of the Navy as a result. Uh, and that's a concern that also brings in the Canadians and Australians who are also concerned about Soviet naval capabilities, in particular those of Soviet submarines. Isabel Campbell has done some great work pointing out how the Royal Canadian Navy uh, is watching and is concerned about growing Soviet naval capabilities around the Arctic and in the North Atlantic in the late 1940s. And so it's a concern that spans all four of these navies that helps to pull them together. At the same time, the Americans are reluctant to take action that will be seen as publicly playing favorites. They don't want to be accused of favoritism and they don't want a bunch of other navies to ask for the level of access that the British Canadians and to a lesser degree the Australians have. So there's an effort to keep these relationships under the table and to not publicize them. So the fact that we have cooperative exercises with the Royal Canadian Navy and the cooperative, some of the cooperative relationships we have with the British are classified to prevent them from being receiving widespread attention in the US press. It's really amazing because one of the things that I came away very appreciative of, you know, I, I, I sailed for the Navy in, in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, and I was on underway replenishment vessels. And we could underway replenish with other vessels seamlessly. It, there was no problems. There was commonality of, of equipment, commonality signals. You know, we, we all were on the same page. There was absolutely no problem. It didn't matter if it was a, a Australian, British, Canadian vessel. It was Boom! It, it was it was it was seamless all the time. Yet that what you paint here is a very interesting picture of how it wasn't as, as as seamless to begin with, and and how you have to overcome those hurdles. And I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about those other navies. I, I think the one of the things I enjoyed the most is is the role the Canadians and Australians have. What, you know, where do they want to fit into this equation? I mean, Canada comes out of World War II with the third largest navy on the planet. And, and now all of a sudden they got to reposition themselves. The Australians who had always been aligned so closely with the British really find themselves more closely aligned with the Americans at the end of World War II. Uh, how are they feeling about this, this threat? You know, is Australia really worried about a Soviet threat or, or is Canada worried about that? And, and more importantly, how are they fixing to the, really deal with the behemoth that are the British Navy and the American Navy? So for the Canadians, I should say both of the both of these navies, the British or the Canadians and the Australians, both want to have good close relations with the U.S. Navy. There's no question about that. For the Canadians, they enjoy a more unique place in American thought, and they're generally aware of that. That because of their North Atlantic connection, because of a shared border, uh, that it, it is easier for the U.S. military to exchange and to share with the Canadians than it is for the U.S. military to do so with other navies. The, uh, for, the, for the Canadians, there's, th there's different views within the Canadian Navy. There's some elements of the Canadian Navy that really want to emphasize ties with the Royal Navy. There's other elements that want to emphasize ties with the U.S. Navy. I'd say on the whole, the, the Canadian Navy uh, has its closest ties with the U.S. Navy, both in anti-submarine warfare, but also in naval aviation, because the Canadians are developing a naval aviation capability you have HMCS Magnificent and then later HMCS Bone Adventure. So, and they recognize that the US Navy has considerable skills in this area, and so they want to draw upon that. So there's an American Naval officer who's the deputy director of Canadian Naval Aviation during this period. We have a series of uh, folks who rotate up there to, uh, to Ottawa to serve in that capacity. And the Canadian, uh, the RCN's Naval Air Squadrons will come to Rhode Island and do training on American carriers. They'll adopt US Navy landing signals uh, um, landing signals and our, you know, approach to carrier aviation. For the Australians, they're, they're also interested in getting experience. They send a group uh, to observe an American carrier of the Valley Forge during its trip down to Australia in 1948. For the Australians, it, in a strategic sense, they don't want to have a, a repeat of 1941-1942, where a threat in the Pacific uh, led or the British were unable to respond in the way that they had hoped to a threat in the Pacific 
because of what was going on in Europe. And they're concerned about that happening again. And so the British have asked the Australians to make a commitment of forces, both to the defense of uh, Malaya, but primarily to securing the Middle East and the Mediterranean. And the Australians want to be assured that the US Navy and the United States is going to, in some sense, guard the back door, the phrase they use. They want somebody to bolt the back door before they engage in this commitment. And the US Navy plays an important role with that. And so uh, Rear Admiral Collins, who becomes the, uh, the head of the Australian Navy, the first member of the Australian Naval Board, visits Pearl Harbor several times to build relationships and make connections with the commander of the Pacific Fleet. And the, the photograph you've got uh, here, which is the Valley Forge entering Sydney in February 1948, is one of those elements of ties between the two navies. We have, you can see if you look at the record of American ships visiting Australia, there's a steady drumbeat of ships that visit in this period, the late 1940s, as uh, even as the Pacific Fleet is drawing down in size. So the fact that we're still visiting Australia is a significant commitment. I've been listening to uh, the Australian Sea Power podcast, which are really a, a great, fantastic series that they do. And John Collins always emerges as, as one of these big uh, uh, heroes uh, yeah. among them and uh, really just an interesting uh, uh, character. But the, what you talked about, I think is so important there is, is that you're basically recounting what the Australian experience in World War II. They don't want to be stuck with their forces in the Middle East and all of a sudden war happens on their front door. And so they're really trying to tie that in with the United States, which I think is, is so important. How ready is the United States to assume this role of, you know, someone's got to be kind of the lead agency here. Someone's got to be the coordinating factor among these, these navies. How, how ready is the U.S. Navy to assume this role of, of almost a permanent alliance system with other navies? It's something that they're not used to. I mean, you go to the interwar years, the U.S. Navy is not operating with really anybody. And now you're talking about them. I mean, because they literally are going to have to. They can't cover the globe, even as big as the U.S. Navy is. They still have to cede certain areas to other nations to guard. How ready is the Navy to do that? So I'd, I'd say that the, the fleet commands, so 7th Fleet, Pacific Fleet, 6th Fleet, Sink Nelm, the Commander-in-Chief, U.S. Naval Forces, uh, East Atlantic and Mediterranean, the fleet commands are the, the elements of the Navy most interested and most connected with these other navies and for obvious reasons. Uh, you know, they're geographically in those places. The, the Navy is, I'd say the Navy's record is mixed in terms of its preparation going into this period for being the hub of this multinational naval alliance. And in particular, there's some, just some administrative issues with the Office of Naval Intelligence uh, managing information flow. And one of the things that they struggle with is figuring out how do we manage the scale of information flow that is gonna be required to have these close relations with an Office of Naval Intelligence that is not really staffed to do that. It's more staffed for episodic and periodic requests for information and requests for visits to bases rather than sustained extensive contact, which is what the, these four navies are trying to put together in this period. So they go through a series of steps where they, they, they reach workable solutions, but there's some fumbling around to try and figure out what is going to work in order to exchange information the way that we want to. One of the things that the British and Canadians in particular will realize is that they can get a lot more information out of the U.S. Navy if they will set up themselves liaison personnel in U.S. Navy facilities outside of the Washington, D.C. area. So, for example, in Key West, Florida, both the British and the Canadians will try and establish, uh, if not a permanent presence, then a recurring a series of visits that allow them to make contacts with American personnel who are working on anti-submarine warfare in Key West. And that gives them advance notice that the Americans are working on this, that they're pursuing that technical approach or these tactics. And it gives them that insight that sometimes they couldn't get simply by working through the Office of Naval Intelligence in Washington. One of the elements you get into, and I think this is really important because I, I really found interesting that idea of, of it's not the top down that's doing a lot of this. It's right in the middle. It's, it, it's, it's, it's these mid-range officers. And, and you made a point of talking about two naval attaches, which I found really interesting. I think one of the reasons, number one, is, is you mentioned Stephen Jerica, and that name just jumped off the page. If, if you know anything about the Doolittle Raid and, and, and 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, that name was, was, was right there, but also Benjamin Custer. And so you had two very interesting kind of juxtapositions there between those attaches and the roles they play. I was wondering if you could talk a little about them because one of the things I, I do love about the book 
is it, it's not solely a policy driven book. We're not talking about just ships. You got a lot of pers personalities in there, which I enjoyed reading about. So Jerika is the attache in Australia uh, in, he's there from 47 to 49. Uh, I think that's the right dates. Um, and he, while he has great personal relations with members of the Royal Australian Navy, he is not a fan of the government of Prime Minister Benjamin Shifley. And he views the, uh, the Australian government, which is a, a labor government, their uh, more liberal political party, um, as uh, veering too close to communism and being overly submissive and controlled by trade unions. Uh, I wouldn't personally agree with his characterization, but that's his understanding. And that leads him to write a series of reports back to the Office of Naval Intelligence, where he calls, uh, he highlights Australia as a security risk. And his reports play a significant role. They're not the only reason, but they play a significant role in the American military's decision to cut off Australia's access to classified US military information from the summer of 1948 until late 1950, when the Robert Robert Menzies and the Australian, uh, the Conservative Party, they call it the Liberal Party, but the Australian Conservatives come into power. So there's this political element that's going on where Eureka is very unsatisfied with the approach that the Australian government is taking. And he, he has a big impact on Australian American military relations. In contrast to that, Benjamin Custer is the naval attache to Canada. It, he developed very close relations with the Royal Canadian Navy and then uses his contacts back in the American naval aviation community to help the Royal Canadian Navy buy a number of American Avenger uh, anti-submarine planes. And they get them at a discount and they're able to get access to American training and to this equipment because of Custer's willingness to use his contacts back in Washington to support the Royal Canadian Navy. There's one time where he goes back to Washington and is reporting to the head of naval intelligence, who I think at that time is Admiral Inglis. And the head of naval intelligence says, Custer, you act like you're running a naval mission up there. That's not what your job is. Your job is gathering intelligence. And Custer's response is, the, Can the Canadians will give me anything that I ask for. Intelligence exchange is not a problem. Um, what's needed is helping them develop naval aviation. And of course, part of the reason that uh, Custer and elements of the US naval yeah, the U.S. Navy's naval aviation community are interested in helping Canadian naval aviation is they are having a struggle in the United States over the relative merits of land-based aviation and naval aviation. And so if the Canadians are able to be successful in deploying uh, a naval aviation capability, capability, that can help strengthen their argument for the value of carrier aviation uh, that they're having as they're having that debate in the revolt of the admirals. That was a really interesting part there, too. I mean, I, I was unaware of the issues that the Canadians were having with their aviation. I think I, I can't remember if it was Magnificent or, or Bonaventure you mentioned that they were having the issues. And literally, the, the Americans at a very low level start providing them aid, you know, bring their pilots down. Let's, let's get them trained here. I think there's a point where the ship goes aground and so it's out of service. So they actually bring Canadian pilots down to train on American mm -hmm. aircraft carriers. And it just it's, it seemed like that that should have been <laughs> decision made at a much higher level than it's actually made at. And it seems to be made. Because of, again, like you said, you know, we need support and, and the Canadian Navy was so instrumental for us in World War II. We really need the Canadians to have that capability going forward. And, they, and it didn't seem they were getting it. And I, I don't know if it, if it was in there or not, because I really didn't see it. it. It seemed like the Canadians weren't getting it from the British like they should have been. And so they, were, they seemed to be turning a little bit more toward the Americans in that post-war period. I'd say they're, they're still getting significant aid from the Royal Navy. Uh, so there's British naval aviators who are helping them develop their naval aviation capability. They're certainly getting a lot of their uh, anti-submarine equipment and training from the British. In particular, when the Canadians build their Joint Maritime Warfare School, they model it on the British Joint Anti-Submarine School. So in terms of their approach to training and to tactics, they still have close ties with the Royal Navy, um, they, but they're also having good relations with the Americans. Uh, and, and at times, they're able to serve as the intermediaries between the two. Uh, where they can kind of smooth over transatlantic naval relations. That seemed like a, a, a big role for them uh, for doing that. And, and again, th this is such a, an interesting compilation because one of the things that you do is, is, is you kind of break down all these elements from that period of right at the end of World War II. And, and then you have the test bed, which is Korea. And, and I thought, again, 
I thought that's such a nice way to kind of wrap it together because Korea becomes really that testing ground for it. Even though you have NATO created in 1949, it's still in its infancy. But here, all of a sudden, thrown into the mix is, is, is an armed conflict. And, you know, in many ways, I, I think Korea gets looked at more and more today as being really the, the precursor for how we fight wars throughout, you know, forward. It's not going to be a World War II peer on peer conflict, but it's going to be more like a Korea war, a Korean war conflict. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that experience, because it, it's a mixed bag, that experience. It, it's, it's not a smooth operation in any way. Yeah, the, the, the initial operations off Korea, where the, uh, the American carrier Valley Forge operates with the British Triumph, benefit from the fact that the two navies had exercised together back in March. And so they're, the British had practiced using American signals and American procedures. So it, initially, they're able to, you know, to, to do those uh, uh, airstrikes on North Korea working together as a group, as you can see uh, in the maps that you've got up. What they eventually develop is kind of a two, they divide the Korea, the Korean coast into two parts. You have the west coast and the east coast, and the American fleet carriers operate off of the east coast, and off the west coast is where American escort carriers and light carriers and British and the Australian carrier, the Sydney, take turns to generally keep one of those carriers, one of those smaller carriers on station at any given time. And they do have challenges when George Dyer, who's uh, one of the, he's on the Pacific Fleet Intelligence, on the Pacific Fleet staff in 1941 and later serves as an intelligence officer for Admiral King during World War II. When he takes command of Task Force 95, there are some tensions in his relationships with the, uh, the Royal Navy uh, ship that are under his command. There's a number of British officers feel that he is, uh, to use a modern phrase, he's not using mission command where he's uh, being too directive and too controlling of the, the British ships that are on the West Coast and insisting that they get into the war more and fire have more unobserved naval gunfire. So that there are some tensions there. Dyer leaves eventually and that does lead to an improvement of relations on the West Coast. What the, the two navies find, because they operate together mostly on the West Coast, or the, as I shouldn't say just two, you know, it's a number of navies that are involved, but the ones that I'm looking at specifically, is that they benefit for, significantly from having exchange officers, people who will go and spend time on somebody else's ship and then come back, talk about best practices, and just see how somebody else does business. They also benefit from meeting up with one another. So they'll, they're usually going to Sasebo or Yokohama back in Japan, and then going to the, the Korean West Coast. And they'll try and meet up with their carrier that they're exchanging with, that they're the duty carrier, and spend a couple hours, um, or even just transfer notes to share experiences. And they find that a useful way to, uh, to build upon the operational knowledge that they're putting together. One of the other areas that they find uh, is a, a potential source of, of tension is the scale of communications. The U.S. Navy just sends signals on a larger scale than the Royal Navy is used to. And so they have to beef up their communication personnel in order to keep up with just the amount of American signals. Uh, and then there's also issues, of course, as there often are with, do I have the right code? Can I decrypt this message? Um, so the, the, these are some of the issues that they have to work through. Yeah, I was really uh, uh, surprised. Anyway, actually, I shouldn't say surprised because I really wasn't <laughs> about the issue with American pilots using improper uh, 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 phrases and, and, and words when calling in airstrikes or, or gunfire support. And, and uh, I was really taken aback by, by the experience the Royal Navy and the Canadians and the Australians have. With, with And it's always a problem, it seems like. It's like these Americans just are not doing what they're supposed to do. It's the Americans that aren't standardizing, whereas the other navies are standardizing. But I think your point about the interaction between the navies on, you know, not on the gun line or, the, or you know, on the carrier box, but back in port and in, in off-duty type environments and training operations is so essential because that's how you learn about the other navies and the other ships. And, and that really comes through. Would you, would you make the contention then that, that Korea really becomes the test case for the larger integration of NATO navies and these particular navies as Australia is not part of NATO? Uh, in the period after the wars? Yeah, I, I think it leads to a growing realization amongst all these navies, but in particular amongst the US Navy, that as you said, that this is probably gonna be how we fight more often than not in the future. There's just a, a, a very large number of American naval officers who if you look at their memoirs or their reports or their letters, 
they are they note the international flavor of the naval operations and they say something to the effect of and we think this is probably going to be how things are going to happen in the future which leads to the conclusion that we need to be prepared to operate in this way and we need to give time and attention and money to thinking about and preparing for operating with other navies on a more regular basis so i do think it leads to a growing awareness it also serves as an evaluation of the progress that's been made in the past four years. And my argument would be that significant progress is made, not that they fully worked out all the, all the kinks, but they have made progress. One of the things that they've done is they've written common tactical, tactical books, Allied Tactical Publication One, which comes into use in Korea uh, towards the end of the conflict. And so Korea in that sense serves as a test for the standardization efforts that are going on back in Washington. And still an iteration of ATP-1 still is being used by those navies mm -hmm. today. It's just been upgraded and, and uh, changed over time. I, I want to go back for a second because I, I do want to talk about that, that training level on, on a lower level, the, the integration of liaison officers, of, of, of facilities. Uh, there was a moment there you talk about how, uh, I forget which nation was, was kind of uh, prohibited from going to the Navy War College for a period of time. How crucial was that? And, and did it go both ways? Was the U.S going over into Canadian, Australian, Royal Navy facilities, or were those Navy, other navies just using U.S. Navy facilities? So I, I'd say it's definitely going both ways. So there are British ships that come to, to Key West to do anti-submarine trials, and then we also send ships to train at the Royal Navy's anti-submarine school uh, at Londonderry. For example, the, there's usually two or three destroyers and sometimes a cruiser, American ships that are assigned to kind of the Northern European patrol, they peel them off from the Sixth Fleet. Those ships almost always stop in at London Dairy for any submarine training, and they often comment on how what high quality training they receive while they're at London Dairy. Uh, in terms of uh, professional military education, you know, you mentioned the the Naval War College. The British and the Canadians do have officers who are there uh, after the war, and they're able to stay there up until 1950-1951, when due to French requests to be admitted and to have their personnel come to the National War College and the Naval War College, the US military makes the decision, we're not gonna play favorites, so we're just kicking everybody out. And this really upsets the British in particular. They were very frustrated by the US Navy's decision to not allow their officers to attend the Naval War College. British argument was we give y'all full access to everything we have. We were invited and had American officers who are at the Imperial Defense College and the Royal Naval War College in Britain. And so they're really frustrated by this. Ultimately, the, the solution they come to is in 1955, they create what's called the Naval Command Course, which is specifically designed at Newport for foreign officers. And a version of that continues to today. And obviously, foreign military personnel are prominent presidents at American military schools around the country. Your conclusion is, is entitled Deep and Wide Links, and, and you make a very interesting connection here. So I was wondering if you can expand on that. What are these deep and wide links that you refer to? So I, I kind of divide it into two categories because you have some types of links between these navies, like training exercises or ship visits that give a large number of personnel more brief experience operating with somebody else. Uh, so if a carrier task force does a combined operation with the British carrier task force, you know, all the personnel are going to get some level of experience. And that's a lot of folks. Whereas at the same time, they also have deep links where one or two or a smaller number of personnel get really intensive experience working with and operating with one of the other navies. And you get that in military exchanges or military educational exchanges in staff positions naval attaches, liaison billets, exchange officers, all of those types of links give deep experience to a smaller body of personnel. But having both these deep links as well as these wide links emphasizes the strength of the relationship between these four navies during this period. And I think you can see that all, all these navies are making efforts to develop both types of links. They recognize that one or the other will be insufficient for their needs. I want to take you out of the book for a second because one of the things that I got reading the book was this is a period of time when the U.S. Navy, even though it's 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 larger than any other navy in, on the planet, faces a huge curtailing at the end of World War II. It's really trimmed down in size, and 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 it, it's not as big and as as global as it was during World War II. It needs these alliances to be able to operate. It basically you have to take the old map of the Royal Navy 
squadron stationed around the world and, and divide that up among these nations to really cover the globe. And, and really not until the 1970s, 80s, does the U.S. Navy really take that full, you know, usurp everything and can de deploy fleets everywhere around the planet and maintain it. But today it's very interesting because I, I got the impression reading this is like we seem to be falling into this kind of structure today where we don't have that capability we once had. And I'm wondering how much alliances like this are going to be much more important today and into the future. So, you know, you're, you're a professor of strategy at the Air War College. I'm going to make you put on your strategy hat here and talk about what's the long-term implication of an event like this. Is this something that we maybe need to think about and maybe there's new navies on the horizon we should be building alliances with? Well, I certainly think, yeah, you know, relying more on allies is a natural response when any service, and, you know, the U.S. Navy in particular, is limited in its size. So as you're downsizing and as, you know, the U.S. Navy's, uh, the size of the battle force has fallen over the last, you know, 20 or 30 years, looking to partners and seeing what partners can do is a natural response. And I think that probably will be um, or could be an important uh, way for the U.S. Navy to continue to operate and uh, you know to project power abroad in the coming years and I, I would tend to agree that I think there are you know new navies that we can be developing relationships with uh, at the same time I think the Navy does recognize the value of relationships with other navies so they have the the, the symposium up at Newport every year where heads of navies come together for the International Sea Power Conference um, that does a great job of giving chiefs of navies the opportunity to make connections and to work and to talk with each other. We have things like RIMPAC, uh, where navies come together to operate on a regular basis, as well as you know, NATO exercises. So in that sense, I think the Navy does recognize the value of these relationships. And, but I would, I would absolutely agree that I think they will be important in the future. Corbin, I'm interested in, in the response you've gotten back from the book so far. I know it's only been out for a short period of time, but what have you been hearing back on the book? What kind of response are you getting from the U.S. Navy or from maybe the Allied navies? Oh, well, I, I haven't got anything, you know, officially from the from the U.S. Navy, but uh, so, so far the, the, res, the response has been positive, which has been gratifying. Uh, I've gotten a, um, a couple of nice notes from, you know, folks who've seen the book and read it, and so that's always uh, enjoyable uh, to hear uh, as an author. The uh, uh, I, I hope that it is a, a book that is of uh, relevance today, as I think, you know, as you mentioned, international naval relationships and international military relationships are as important as ever and are certainly one of the, the, the strengths that the United States enjoys is the number of allies, the number of militaries that we have good relations with. Well, it really seems like a how-to book and how to build an, you know, how to build an operating agreement and an operating environment with, with nations. You know, the U.S. comes out of World War II having worked with all these navies in the past, so it had that previous experience. But as you mentioned, going forward, we may find ourselves working with navies we don't have a large, you know, history of operating with the Indian Navy, Vietnamese Navy, who knows down the, the path, what, what Navy we may have to operate with. And it seems like you put together a kind of, you know, almost a how-to manual of what needs to be done to make this operate on, on various levels and potential pitfalls to be identified uh, down the road. Uh, what's next? So what are you working on now that we can look forward to? So I'm actually working on a, a book that looks at the, the World War II experience of the, the U.S. Navy of its allies, because so I, I cover that you know, somewhat briefly in a chapter in this book, and I really want to go back and look at that in more detail to look at Task Force 99 and the Anzac Squadron and the 1941-1942 convoy operations in the North Atlantic and look at how did the Navy work with its partners, and in particular, how did the legacy of World War I impact that? One of the things that I've noticed, it, just as I'm kind of doing some preliminary research for this book, uh, Rear Admiral Turner in the ABC One Talks in early 1941 is very insistent that American naval forces ought not be distributed in penny packets uh, amongst larger allied fleets. He, want there, he wants there to be a specific zone of responsibility that the U.S. Navy has and for American ships to be under American command. And so I want to kind of look at where did that idea come from and what's the impact of that on Navy to Navy relations in the early parts of World War II before they've developed the full-fledged cooperation that comes later in the war. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting topic. I, I do a lot on, obviously, the sea lift effort in World War I and, and the deployment of the destroyers down to uh, uh, Queenstown. 
and really the integration into the Royal Navy structure there, you know, even though they're operating as a, as a closed in unit, they're still under a uh, Royal Navy Admiral. Whereas the case, if you look at the Mediterranean, where they divide it up into areas is not as efficient, it seems to be as under this one unified Western approaches command that you see there. And, and I, I agree with you. I, I think one of the, the, the unheralded and really li little talked about elements is, is how the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy were able to shift forces around and, and, and deploy, you know, the deployment of Alabama and South Dakota to the home fleet to free up the Royal Navy to go down the Mediterranean. You know, those little elements, which are, which are footnotes lots of times in big general histories, I think are so important to understanding the global nature of fighting a, a war as World War II is. And, and I, I really felt that in your book, that first chapter, which is a brief chapter, like you said, just kind of you cover a lot of history there, but there's so much in there. And, and, and you know, you, you touch on so many key things. I could definitely see your interest in, in going further with that. I want to thank our guest, Corbin Williamson, for joining us for our NASO video podcast. We will have a link to U.S. Navy and its Cold War alliances, 1945 to 1953, in the show notes. If you liked our video podcast, be sure to click like on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Twitter, or give it five stars on your podcast provider. Please subscribe to our channel to receive updates as we continue to interview maritime historians. You can follow NASO on Facebook or Twitter and at NASO underscore history. The best way to follow NASO is to become a member. As such, you receive our quarterly journal, Northern Mariner, which we publish jointly with the Canadian Nautical Research Society. Go to www.naso.org and click on membership to join. Until our next talk, keep sailing.